Cheers, Pete. Um, morning, everyone. Um, so just a big thank you um, to everyone for joining this morning. Um, another football club, uh, football collective uh, away from the numbers session. Um, just extend a thanks to Carol, Jean, Pia and Jill for joining us this morning. And I'll hand over to Jean, um, who's going to do some introductions. Mm -hmm. hey, I was going to let the players introduce themselves. Oh, OK, yeah, that's they, fine. You know, they, they, are the, um, they, they are the famous people. I was only ever a, a very, very average um, Sunday afternoon footballer. <laughs> The kind of player who used to win most improved or um, or clubman, so you you get an impression of how good I actually was. Um, so I'll, I'll let them talk for themselves. But um, the purpose of today is just really to um, remember and uh, to discuss the significance of that first European uh, Women's Championship, uh, which ran from 1982 to to 1984. And just to get some memories of, of that particular day, um, England and Sweden were, were already by then, England's first um, official match was 1972. So by 1982, England and Sweden were already um, rivals. And actually England had their first loss ever in an international to Sweden, um, 10 matches in. So it was already a, a very well-established rivalry by the time that it took place. Um, so I was just going to ask each person in turns, if we could start with Carol uh, as the England captain, and then for a bit of balance, if we could go to Pia, and then if we could go to Jill, if you could just say a little bit about yourselves and also what the announcement of a women's Euro competition meant to you at the time? Over to you, Carol. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah, I was, I'm Carol Thomas. Um, I was first selected for the England team in 1974. Um, I became captain in 1976. I played 56 times for my country, which was a great honour in them, in them days. And I captained them 51 times. Um, a lot of the tournaments we were in when I first joined were uh, unofficial, obviously, and the 1984 was the first official UEFA Championship. Um, we were all really excited about it and um, that women's football was getting some recognition at, at long last after a lot of hard work by the uh, WFA. Um, we had we had some tough um, qualifying matches. Um, we had a, a good squad around us, um, and one of the one of the best best things at the time was when we actually beat Denmark in the semis to go on and meet Sweden in the final. And we was really uh, looking forward to that. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Pia, could you give us a, a perspective from Sweden? Well, uh, Sweden played their very first game in 1973 against Finland and they draw 0-0. And I remember I heard about that and I was 13 years old. And two years later, I, I played my first game for Sweden. And I, actually, I played against England, 1975 in Gothenburg. And uh, Ann Jonsson, Hammarby, she scored two goals. And since then, I was called up in the national team for 20 years, uh, more or less. This specific uh, year, 1984, it, was, it meant everything to me. Because then we had a chance to compete against the best teams. And you can imagine England. When you say England, uh, it's about football. And um, I also recall the first uh, leg in, in Gothenburg. We won 1-0. And I was so um, sure about the outcome uh, going over to, to uh, England and play Luton. And I remember the bad weather. I remember we lost 1-0 and the penalty kicks. And as far as I remember, it was only one Swedish player that was good enough game and it was a midfielder Anna Svenneby 
but also the story about uh, winning the European Championship was um, something absolutely uh, fantastic, and uh, people remembers that today even. So it's a, it's a important for uh, one that loves football and want to play. And uh, it started with I I wasn't allowed to play when I was a girl because there were no such a thing as female football. Thanks, Pia. Jill, Jill, could you give your perspective? Um, unmute, Jill. Jill, Jill, Jill if you just un un unmute your phone um, to your top right on the iPad. You hear me now? Yeah, can hear you. Yeah, now. that's real. Uh, just a little bit like Carol and Pia, really. Um, obviously, I had my first England call up at 13. Um, was in and out of squads, probables versus possibles, until I got my first cap in May 1981, uh, when I was 18. And, um, well, the rest is history, really. And, you know, you think about playing for England in your tournaments, and, I mean, I was 21 at the time, and obviously Carol's been going a little bit longer than me, and, you know, I was there with the best, and, and to play in any football tournament, football tournament. Which, uh, what it is, it's it's absolutely fantastic and to be fair if when we get talking about the game I don't think the game should have gone ahead if you've seen some of the photos as regarding the pitch I don't think any football match would be played on that pitch but that's just how history is and for us to be the first especially for England to to be recognized I think it's it's you know it's the best thing and to talk about it is even better because, you know, I talk to people in football now and, and, and tournaments get dismissed, just like the year, really, of, of the women's game. So, you know, again, a little bit like Pia, you know, we had no girls' football teams in our era. And, and, and to, to do what we went on to do, it, it was incredible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally, okay. yeah. Ch Ch could you tell us a little bit more, then? Pia's mentioned the dreadful weather. I've seen photographs of pitch which we tried to share in that image that we used I mean it it, it literally looked like it had been ploughed the day before <laughs> I think it rained I think from the Friday I'm not so sure and I think we're all saying oh it's going to be cancelled it's going to be cancelled and I think when we walked out there and saw the pitch before obviously we got changed and I thought it's never going to go ahead but it went ahead and I think it was just a case of really you could play football, it was a case of just trying to get it out of the mud. And I think if you look at one caption that I've sent through with Carol was there, I think with Martin in the centre circle, and there's myself there trundering off. And, you know, I mean, they're things that are going to stay with you forever and they'll never go away. Jill, i seen that picture of the... Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Jane. i I seen the picture of the, um, the pitch and I, I couldn't believe that the game went ahead. And, uh, yeah... I can't believe you could pick a kick a ball for me, really. I think it's called going from back to front in one kick, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did the first leg been like in, in Sweden? What were the conditions like then? Um, Carol, do you answer that one? Okay, yeah, it was, it was nice and sunny. It was a lovely stadium we played in, um, completely different to the uh, Luton debacle, really, <laughs> regarding the pitch. Um, it was a, a lovely pitch, nice and sunny, and uh, a pleasure to play in. Yeah, and the, oh, there's a big crowd there as well, yeah. What did Pia, th what did Pia think to the pitch? What did well, it was such a big difference from the game in Gothenburg. And as you said, it was a fairly big crowd. And uh, when we won that game, 1-0. And I thought we had a, it was a good game. And looking forward to uh, going to England. And when you saw the pitch, uh, you know, uh, we had such a good feeling. So, yeah, first of all, uh, we questioned whether we should play or not. But uh, we just had to play. Uh, but what I remember with the, with the surface was penalty kicks because usually I just place the ball uh, and I, I took the last penalty kick and uh, the goalkeeper Elizabeth Lading and she told me now it's just a disaster 
if if you didn't put down the ball, you can't do it. So she said, you just have to kick it. So she actually helped me to make the right decision. So uh, I, I took the last penalty kick and it was just a uh, crazy surface. And um, yeah, as I said, I thought uh, only one play in the midfield, she played well. And um, it was a little bit unlucky. It could have been such a good, another such a good game. But, um, well, it, uh, it is what it is. And we were dirty and happy afterwards. What do you reckon playing? What did you reckon playing with the size four football? Yeah, number four size. Remember, yes. And I remember the discussion that we weren't uh, strong enough. We didn't have the endurance and this and that. And it has to be different between men and women. And uh, but I think that was the last year we actually played with the size four, as far I recall. That's brilliant. Thank you, Pia. Was yeah, it, um, I just thought I'll... Sorry, Pachin. Was it over 90 minutes? No, I think it was 80. Oh, I thought Correct. it was... Correct. Two times four. Now, yeah, two times 40 minutes. Yeah, I think it was 80. That's probably why Carol Lee lasted longer. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Alex. You go. That, okay, that was brilliant, guys. Thank you for that. I just want to start us off with um, some questions between Jean and I, and we'd like to little, know a little bit about your your memories of the new the new competition and what the the level of competition was like um, in 1984. And if I start with you, Carol. Yeah. Well, obviously, it was it was all new to us, and. Um... We, we played the uh, home country, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. um, and the squad that we had um, sort of all came together at, at that time. Um, Matt, Martin Regan was a very uh, shrewd man, he, he got the squad together and um, it was a great experience. It was to be playing in the first ever official competition, um, I think every one of the squad, whether they played or not, um, were, were up for it. And we had a good team behind us. Uh, we had a good team on the pitch, reserves and, and everybody. And it was a pleasure to play in and be around at that time. And a, an honour to be in the first ever UEFA competition. And did you expect to go as far as you did? Um, Probably not. I mean, we were quietly confident, but um, we, we were never allowed to get above ourselves, um, with Martin being a, a shrewd Yorkshireman. Um, but um, every time we went on, out on the pitch, we, we did our best for him. And uh, the further along we went, um, the more we started to think, oh, well, yeah, this is a little bit further, yeah. Brilliant. And, and Pia, can you, can you tell me about your memories of the first European Championships and, and what the level of competition was like in 1984? Well, we uh, we thought we had a really good team and we had a really good coach in Ulf Lidfors. He was the captain, uh, the, the coach of the team and he taught us uh, a lot of things about tactics actually. And um, I also remember uh, the different roles we had. So the goal we scored in Sweden, for instance, it was a centre back and um, uh, the pre-game talk before, uh, the coach Ulf said that, you know what, you're defending. We're going to play uh, one of the most important games ever, so you stay back. The goal scored is actually she's not doing what the coach told her. So she passed the line, the midline, she takes a couple of steps, and she serves the ball into the box. And I had a diving header, I scored the first goal. And I think I usually bring up that specific situation where you are so prepared, but there are sometimes when you gain so much confidence like she did, she she made the right decision. Uh, so I thought that was pr pretty cool actually. And um, uh, to advance to the final, we had to beat Italy, uh, and that was two fantastic games. Uh, and and then again, back then and even today, when you say football. 
me at least, I, I think about England and I think about Italy. And uh, we won 3 2 uh, away and 1 2 0 home. And after the 84, I be become a professional player because the Italian players they wanted me to play in uh, Lazio. So I was, I was a lucky one, um, you know, be a, a part of this fantastic moment with the European Championship. And then I became the first uh, professional player in Sweden the next year after. Oh, that's incredible. And, um, and Jill, what can you tell me about your memories about the, the competition and what you thought the level of competition was like for the first years? I think like Carol said, I think we played against the own nations. So um, you could be playing against some of the girls, you know, against each other every week, depending on what teams they were playing against. Um, but yeah, I mean, the level was obviously, it must have been a good level for us to have the squad that we had. I think the girls mm -hmm. that we had, we had, oh, I think we probably, in that squad, I think there was 15 of us. And I would say whoever played that day would have given as much as what any of us would have given. All talented. Yeah. I still believe to this day that squad of players, and even down the years when we've played since, Carol and retired, I still think if you put that team out now with the team, what people have got now in the era that women's football is, we could still fend for ourselves because your talent doesn't disappear. And the mm -hmm. talent that we had on that on that day, I mean, you know, the two centre-backs in Angie Gallimore and Lorraine Hansen, you know, two stalwarts of the game. And then you sent two centre-midfield players in Liz Deegan and um, Debbie Bampton. I mean, and Pat Chapman on one side and me on the other. And then Kerry Davis and Linda Curl. I mean, what a team that was. You know, and you, you can put that on paper of some of the, the teams I've represented for England as like for like. You know, you, you could use probably Linda Curl as a Karen Walker. You could use Brenda Sampari as a Leeds Deegan. You could use Carol Thomas as, a, as um, what could we say, an Alex Scott. So, you know... These, these girls made their mark and we had limited time really, to be honest, because, you know, we, we seemed to come up to that game and we played the semi-finals, the Danish uh, home and away. We won that and we, we just thought, right, we're in a final. And I don't think people could believe it really. And I think I would imagine in Pierce country, you know, when they got to the final, the coverage that they would get with the press was totally different to what we had. I think we had probably one man and his dog, I think, probably, you know, sniffing around the hotel for interviews. I would imagine Piers would probably be 10 or 15, 20 journalists. Um, but, you know, you, you, we can't, we can look at these memories and the, the good thing is they can't take it away from us. We were the first to, to be in that and, you know, unfortunately we lost on penalties. But, you know what, if you said to me, shall we relive it again? Let's do a Harry's Heroes home and away and let's do it all again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go for that, Jill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think the standard of football, you know, football's football, like Pierce says, and it's about you as a, as a player. And it's, you know, I mean, people will ask me and no doubt they've asked Carol and I've asked you, Alex, yesterday. Do you miss it? Well, yeah, of course you miss it. I think it's the banter of what you've got with, with each other. And, you know, when you got together with England, we've got to remember that when we turned up for that semi-final and the final, I think we were together maybe two days. Played on the Friday, yeah. met on the Friday and played on a Sunday. You know, to, to play in a European final. And you've all together, I think we might, we might have met, I think, on the Thursday. I'm not so sure. Carol might know a little bit more, but... I seem to think that we're only together two or three days. I would imagine Sweden have probably been together a full week. So obviously the commitments, of, commitments were totally different as well. Obviously the job situations that we all held and, and one thing and another. So that didn't, that didn't help us because obviously people were struggling to get time off. But, you know, I, I just think that, you know, what you've brought on today to, to get these people on board, I think it's it's absolutely fantastic for other, peers, other people to hear. Yeah, thank you. Shall I, shall I come in there? Because I think most people don't realise um, when the FA was founded, because you, you, you didn't get any money at all from, from the FA, um, when the WFA was founded, and I'm 
you know, I'm sure um, if, if we had some of the um, officers from the WFA on here, they, they would tell us that the grants actually came from the Central Council for Physical Recreation, uh, which is basically an arm that funded a lot of Olympic sports, which basically meant that any woman who played for England had to be amateur because Central Council for Physical Recreation only <coughs> supported amateur athletes. So this is why Sue Lopez had to make that difficult decision, didn't she, whether to come back from Italy to play for her country as an amateur or to remain in uh, Italy and go on to a professional career like, like Pia did. Um, and it's only really mm -hmm. Kerry Davis, I think that only really changed in the mid 80s after this. Um, and it was only really Ker Kerry Davis, was it? And then Deb Bampton went out to Italy for a, for a season. Um, yeah, then I think later on, I think Jane Stanley then went to Belgium. She had a good tour, I think she's still out there, I'm not so sure. She went out there after that. So, so Pia, what, what were conditions like as a professional footballer in Italy? Well, uh, it's funny because um, in 85, uh, I, I went to uh, Rome and played for Lazio. and. Uh, Everything around me was about football. So uh, uh, to, even today, I'm a little bit surprised the fact that I dared to to move away from from Sweden, but I just follow the ball. That was, uh, you know, a dream come true to uh, just play football every day. Now, and Lazio, they have practiced three times a week and a game. So it was very disappointed. So I had to do so many things outside the, the football to make sure that I stayed fit. Uh, but I learned to be more humble, to be honest, because uh, they, the, the drills, the, the warm up, everything was very different. And me coming from Sweden and the European Championship and so on, and all of a sudden you have, uh, I had a new language to learn and even a little different kind of football to play. And uh, I, I recall uh, Carolina Muraccia, and everybody knows her if you've been in the women's game, playing so many games uh, and also be coaching in many teams, countries as well. And that was, uh, I just stayed for a season because I, I went back to Sweden uh, to educate, uh, to be a sports teacher. And that was a lucky move because then I was uh, working for the Swedish FA. Uh, because, as you mentioned, uh, as a player, as a w woman and playing in the game, you didn't get anything. You know, it was a hobby. But uh, we had a job uh, and, and then we, uh, you know, had practice at six o'clock in, in the evening. And, uh, uh, and we were happy if you had a good coach, because sometimes you didn't. But if you have a good coach and a good organization, you were, you were yeah, you were happy about that. It's... Uh, when you talk about the women's game today, it's easy for me to be grateful because uh, it's such a big difference today. Now I'm coaching the Brazilian national team and they get paid and they get, uh, they get some money from the CBF, the Federation. But back then it was pure um, hobby. And I think there have been people uh, before... The, the next generation and the next generation be fighting for the women's right on the pitch. And I'm, I'm one of them and I'm really proud of that. And I'm happy to see the World Cup last year, for instance. So, so it's, been, it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, it, it hasn't come easy to us. We have been working hard, fighting. And, and that's why it's, uh, it's great to look around and see how, well, it's it's been it's it's good to be a, a, a female player today compared to back in the good old days. Uh, yeah, to, totally agree with you there, Pia. Certainly, when I started in the um, in the seventies, uh, we we all had full time jobs. And um, when I joined Jill at playing for Round Trees, a, a team in York, we had to train twice a week and then play on the Sundays. And representing our international team, the England team, we, we had to do extra training, so we were just that little bit fitter for when we went on to international duty. And then every, every day we were doing a full-time job as well. 
we certainly did it for the love of love of the game. And I I think the players of our time in the uh, late sixties, early seventies, early eighties were true prior pioneers of the game, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you certainly are, Carol, and I think um, certainly when, when we were playing football, we, we owed everything to sort of the players that went before us, and there's probably not enough recognition of that, and I think obviously Jean's trying to, trying to implement that change at the moment, but I think it's really important that the recognition is, is spread around so we don't just remember the game for the FAWSL and nothing else that went before it. Would you agree with that, Jill? Oh, most definitely. I think the thing is, is uh, you're, you're seeing, you know, I, I, obviously I've played against you a couple of occasions. I think I skinned you a couple of times, didn't I? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, you know, it, it's nice that you can see, you know, even though you, we've, we, you touched on it a little bit with <coughs> our career, you're seeing now of what people <clears throat> for us and how they struggled and how... Even we struggled, you know, to, to play international football. And, and you think now of how it's progressed and the progression of it. And, you know, we have come a long way. But, you know, we celebrated, I think it was the men's. I went down to London for a, some kind of a do. And we celebrated 100 years of men's football. And there were people there that, you know, were on the walking sticks. And you think, why aren't we doing that? Why are we not inviting people, you know, past me and Carol's age in our areas, below that onto just one big mass, you know, let's get everybody there. It's, you know, and they'd want to try and forget that era, but without us and people before us, like God bless Sylvia Gore and, and a few more that have gone, you know, without those people, we wouldn't be in the situation. We certainly wouldn't be sat here talking about the 1984 European Championship final. Oh yeah, I agree. And if we if we move back to the to the 1984 um, final, because I'm I'm conscious that we still are going to celebrate that. Can you can you guys remember any major events that um, happened in in the qualifying rounds? What what did you go through to to qualify, Carl? Um, well, I I think um, in the end, when we look back at the qualifying, we we qualified quite comfortably. Um, so our our really fair, uh, first test came against um, Denmark. Um, I think the first game was at Gresty Road, um, and, they, and they were tough opponents. I'm I'm not sure if they, they were well up in the ratings in the women's game at that time. Um, and luckily, we we came we 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 won them and we beat them. Um, to one on aggregate, oh, on the match, sorry. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, great, great, great memories altogether. Yeah, I think I think at that time, Carol, didn't we? Once it, the European champ Championship were just purely based on the countries nearest to you, so i.e., Scotland, Northern Ireland, yeah. Republic of Ireland. Yeah, that's right. Well, that, that's yeah. why we played. The home home team, don't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know whether whether that happened for Piers Group. I don't know whether they played <laughs> Norway, Finland, Iceland. Yeah, we ended up to play in the semi-final against uh, Italy. Yeah. So that was two very good games, and that was semi-final though. So what, yeah. What about your game? What about your games before them? Before the semi-final, Pia? What were your group games? Uh, good question, I recall. But I think we uh, played against uh, the Nordic countries, of course, yeah. but also uh, Netherlands, actually, at the same time. So yeah. um, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was the first uh, 84, the first, U U first European Championship. It was uh, big time, very. And in Sweden, they, they said the women's, they, they do the breakthrough. You know, now it's going to be um, uh, something different for a female player. And I heard that word so many times. 91, the World Cup, breakthrough. 95 in Sweden, breakthrough. Or even in, in uh, the Olympics. So um, 
I think the women's game, at least in Sweden, has done a couple of breakthroughs. And hopefully now it gets more and more uh, recognized, which is so important because that it doesn't matter if, if you have a boy or a girl, you should be able to play football, but also to actually uh, spend a lot of time and get some good coaches. And, and to be honest, that is not the case today. If you look at uh, girls, you know, 10, 9, 10 years old uh, compared to boys. You talk about academies and so on, and still there's a gap. But it started, it started with actually with, uh, with us and a little bit earlier, uh, at least in Sweden. And uh, I'm so grateful for every, uh, everybody's been in the, in, the, in the women's game and done some good things and tried to improve the game. Um, I've, got the, I've got the actual table here, Gail. Um, for Sweden and England were the only team to have to win all six games in the qualifiers. And Pia, you played Norway, Finland and Iceland. We played Scotland, Era and Northern Ireland in our group. But we were the only ones to have uh, six out of six. Something to be proud of? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> that was a deserved final. <laughs> And she's too modest, but Pia was golden boot. Well, <laughs> I think I think Pia's our nemesis anyway, isn't she? I think every year we play Sweden, I think Pia always pops up and scores a winning goal wherever she goes. And we've and obviously I've played against her, and so has Carol. So I think she's always been our nemesis. You know, you, you look at your men's teams, and there's always somebody that scores a goal and for England every time we play. I think Pia's one of them. Yeah, I think I think Pia's diving header in that. In Gothenburg, I think she that I think she dove in front of me actually. That's <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, funny when you're talking about uh, the diving header. I, I still have it on on, uh, on a video, uh, and uh, I've showed that to Abby Warmback. You can imagine. I think she's one of the best uh, players in the air, and she was um, impressive about the, that goal. And even now, when I'm in Brazil, we have so many good plays in the air. Christiana, for instance, but I, when I bring up that 84, and uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of those <laughs> those seconds. <laughs> yeah, your diving header was good, Pierre, but my memory was my goal line clearance. I don't know if you remember that, Jill. Yeah, I did. I, I, so I've seen that. On the, I've seen that on a YouTube video. Yeah, I keep showing it to my grandsons. This is what grandma did. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Alex, what, what are you... Go on, Jean, sorry. Sorry? You think we should open it up to questions? Yeah, I've just got what, what, one more question. Um, just in your experience now, you've all played and, and watched football, and what, if anything's changed the most, would you say, from, from 1984, from the first Euros until the fairly the most recently Euros? Mm. Uh, um, if anyone's got anything, any contribution towards that? Um, for me, for me, I, for me, I think if anything, there's more participation, and, you know. And, and Pia touched on it now when she were talking about you know, there's more girls teams, there's more academies. I think I think that's the, it's the growth. I think of, of it. I mean, the politics is a different issue, and, and what I feel of how the WSL is going to go and things like that. That that could be another edition of a Zoom call. But yeah, to see that, that you know the we all think, you know, that we're going to have that breakthrough and it's going to get better. And even me, in, in my year, I always thought, oh, we're going to go professional one day. We're going to do it. And it, it never happened, unfortunately. But you know what? As long as the growth of the women's game continues and there's girls that you see out there kicking a the ball, then that's the main thing. You know, that's, that's the foundations that everybody's laid in the women's game in my era, Carol's era and people before us. And, and let that continue. It's about how are they going to now divert all this in the right way and in the right manner. Like, I didn't, have a, I didn't have a girls team. I was 13. I was playing in school team. Got banned from playing girls football. You know, we shouldn't be doing that now. We should let, there should be teams out there for girls to go and play off at whatever age they want to play. I mean, I've seen a lot of things in Carol's, Carol's football club, what they're doing. 
you know, Donny Bells are doing, and I'm sure, and obviously, Piers has been involved with the game at international level, and, you know, we see all these squads coming through, but we've just got to be careful on our domestic game of that we don't have too many people coming into to this country to play the women's game, not not allow our girls to, to play themselves and go on and represent England. Because, you know, Sweden have been there, done that. They've won World Championships. They've won gold in the Olympics. We haven't done that yet. And we've been saying it since 1984. And, you know, I think we've just got to be careful and sit down and see which is the right way, the right way for the women's game to go. How about you, Carol? What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I totally agree with Jill. Um, obviously, the, the uh, money that's been pumped in the ladies' game is a, a big difference from our era. Um, grassroots football, I think, same as what Jill has just mentioned it, you know, getting the young girls playing, um, getting it more into schools. You know, there's a lot of local schools around here where the girl, there's not girls playing. Um, the club where my my uh, two grandsons play, they're quite good. But <clears throat> they've got girls teams and well into mixed teams at that age group. So <clears throat> yes, that's that's the biggest biggest thing. And but certainly the money. Um, there was there was no money for us when we when we were playing. Well, we had we actually had to pay money out to represent our country. And. Um, we got a small percentage back, but not not a lot. It, it cost us a lot of money to represent our country, and um, I don't regret it for one minute because I had a great time. And Pia, just finally to finish with you, um, what do you think has changed in the women's game? You know, since that first um, championship in 1984. If you look, if you look at the game itself, the match, uh, everything has changed. You know, it's faster, it's more technical, and more tactical. And uh, I really like the fact that uh, as a Swedish girl, you can now be professional. I was professional for in Italy. Now they are all over the place. Um, in Brazil, I have Marta, and she's playing for, you know, in US. And each country has their own um, culture, so to speak. And uh, that mix is important for the women's game to improve the game. Uh, so I, I really like that. Uh, there's one thing, though, I have to bring up, which I think we had. We had the grit. You know, we were we were fighting. We were well, lack of technique at times, or or even tactics, but we did our very best, and we didn't take anything for granted. So I think that is something. When especially, uh, I can lean on that kind of feeling. Uh, I am. Um, when I start to play, uh, you need the grit in order to be a good player. And um, I, I take the advantage of that now when I'm coached because it won't come easy to me. But I really like we come together, the teamwork. Uh, it, it was, uh, and it has to be exceptional. And uh, that I don't think that's different from, from, you know, compared back then, today. You need a team uh, in order to uh, be successful and play on the highest level. And I'm proud of that. It's great insight. Thank you, Pia. Um, so, Gina, do you think we should be open up for questions now? Yeah, I'm just I'm just conscious we we've, we've got a lot of um, knowledgeable people on the call, and and they might yeah have yeah. So, if we could just um, if anyone wants to ask a question to any of the panel, just turn your mic on and um, and, and your camera so so everyone knows who's who's asking the question. That'd be great. Karen, do you want to start us off? I will do once I can work out the technology. Um, thank you so much for organising this. This is brilliant. Um, I'm actually researching the Scottish team and Scottish football from the 1960s to now. So it's wonderful to hear you and see you because I've only seen your names in programmes. Um, so I've got a couple of questions, but I was going to say that the thing about that championship, it was so important that the home nations played because Scotland couldn't have afforded to play any games and in fact in a couple of championships times they changed that and we had to withdraw halfway through because we couldn't raise the money to come to the games um, you answered one of my questions already in terms of how long before matches you got together because i think there was one occasion when scotland met at the ground 
they hadn't played at all before one of their matches. But so my questions were a bit varied, but one was, did you have to do a lot of sponsorship and fundraising to get the money together? Because that's a theme that runs throughout Scottish football. And also, what was it like as a 13 year old or even younger to start playing in a team um, with fully grown women? Because I've got lots of examples of that in um, the Scottish playing, both nationally and in um, the local teams. Um. Yeah, I, I started playing in Hull at, when I was 11 um, and it was a ladies team um, and I can quite honestly say that I was, I was welcomed, they looked after me, um, I, was, I was a bit of a tomboy as I think we all are when we first started um, but I thoroughly enjoyed it and I, I was well looked after by the girls and uh, that was in the uh, 60s, middle 60s when I started. Um, as when I started playing for the international team, luckily the uh, company I work for were very supportive, and um, they they gave me time off, so I, I didn't have to go looking for sponsorship or anything. And um, if I give them plenty of notice of when the games were coming up, how much time I needed, I didn't need to take holidays or anything. And um, they, they gave me time off, which I was uh, truly grateful for. Yeah. Right, brilliant. It's uh, again same for me as, as Carol. Really, I was quite fortunate. Obviously, when I got to the age that I could work, um, they let me have time off, sufficient time. The, the, I got paid my salary. Um, I do know that there were lots of girls that lost the holidays, uh, left the jobs, even um, took unpaid leave for weeks and weeks. You know, so we've all been down the same same route. As for obviously playing, going from a first training session at 13 with England, I mean, I don't think it'll ever be heard of again, will it? Um, but to be in the game against the same company, you know, Carol was there obviously turning up. Same for when I went to Doncaster Bells, I was 13. Um, everybody was probably 10 years older than myself, but it, there was no relevance to it. I think I think the thing is, with, with the women's game then, um, it, obviously, it's a lot slower. It's obviously you're a bit, you've got more technical ability about it, and I think Pierre touched on it. If, if that's one thing that has gone through the roof of the women's game, it's it's basically how, how how quick and how strong the players are today, and you know they're all on the strength and conditioning courses and things like that, and you know. But I would I wouldn't change what I did. It, it didn't bother me playing at 13 against a woman that were 23, 24, and, and even older. Do you think it helped your game? Because that's one of the things that came through my interviews, that it actually helped some of the, the women. Um, yeah, it did. I mean, you, you know, I think, I think if you're in a happy environment and, and, and you love playing football, and then you, you're bound to improve. But if, if it's where you don't want to be there, then you're not going to improve. But I love my football. I think, like Carol touched on it again, you know, you're, we're all a bit of a tomboy in them days. And, you know, I mean, I used to play football, but nine hours a day I'd, I'd skip school if i could but yeah no 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 problem at 13. thank you jeff um do you want to ask your question yeah sorry alex i forgot to unmute um just, I don't research in this area, but I'm finding it fascinating because um, I've been doing a lot of reading and basically I'm very into running as well. And one thing that's really struck me on listening to you all speak is how it mirrors a lot of the, if you like, sexist discrimination um, that women were facing at the same time in not being allowed to, say, compete in marathons and things like that and kind of fighting against supposedly established thinking and you know and, and, and attitudes um i just wondered what your thoughts were there because it clearly carried through in obviously society and football and other things were very kind of were embodying exactly that and you kind of pushed through that to achieve what you did i just wonder what your thoughts were um yeah we we certainly had a, a lot of uh 
when the the mayor, the, when the men came to watch our games, obviously the the comments I, I won't repeat on here, but um, we 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 certainly had to just ignore that. And both as Jill and Pia have said, we just was there to play the game. We love the game. We love playing it. And after a few years, you could see the same men coming back to watch us, and they were thoroughly enjoying the game. And um, we we again we were pioneers and we pushed through it hopefully um, making it better for the players of nowadays because there's, there's no comments like the comments that we used to get when we were playing football okay thank you i forgot to unmute again <laughs> i've got a dog eating in the background so i didn't want <laughs> even all the time while you were answering Thank you, Carol. Okay, no problem. I think, Kirsty, have you, have you got a question regarding fans? Hi there. Um, thanks for today. It's been really insightful, really interesting. I think I could listen to this like, for the rest of the afternoon, so it's fantastic. Um, a lot of my research regards female fans of women's football, um, and there's not a huge amount out there, so it would be really interesting to kind of understand or get some of your recollections of your from your fan base of, of, of kind of of your time in the game I think the only person that's had a fan base is probably Pia yeah Pia's <laughs> 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 got her own fan base <laughs> <laughs> well you know when when I played uh, in the national team uh, they have to take a leave from the jobs but I was in school so, uh, so for me, it was not a big deal. I just uh, waited for it to be called up, and then I just loved to play the ball. But uh, in the clubs, we had to do different things. And what I really liked about, we didn't get anything for, 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 you know, uh, for free. We have to um, uh, try to put together everything, that the players, and we came up with the ideas how we could do. So it was not only, I thought it was a little bit unfair, I remember. Uh, like Hamabi, I'm 30 years old and um, uh, prepare for the World Cup. And it's all about who's going to uh, use the pitch. And we share the pitch with um, the U18 and U16 uh, men, uh, boys. And that was an ongoing discussion. So that has been the pitch itself has been a little bit about a fight. Uh, because everybody wanted to practice at six o'clock or, or 5 30 something like that and I recall especially here in Stockholm where uh, winter time we have few pitches uh, well sometimes we practice 7 30 or 8 o'clock in, in the evening and uh, I thought uh, that was a little bit unfair and we tried to get better uh, time you know to, to practice a little bit earlier but uh, it has always been, how can we get a little bit more money for, you know, the pre-season pre, uh, and so on. But for the national team, uh, we've never, never done nothing like that. And we, every time we played a game, we had at least two, three days before we played the game. Um, Jean, did you, did you have, a, have a question for Pia? Just on your mic, Jean, sorry. Not concentrated. Um, I, I was just going to ask Pia, um, Carol and Jill have mentioned about how they got into um, football in the UK. Um, how, how did you actually get into football, say, as opposed to other sports? Uh, what was it like in Sweden to, to be a young girl who wanted to play football? Uh, a little bit of lucky because I have five siblings and no nobody plays football. They into horse riding and so on. And I was brought up in a small village and it was my neighbors. And uh, back then, you know, um, uh, I just play with boys. Uh, I don't know why, but my mother and my dad allowed me to play football. Usually there were no girls playing at all. And uh, so as long as you have fun, my, my dad and mom said, which was a, a, a great comment. 
but uh, every weekend uh, they had a game. I was not allowed to play. Uh, at the time, I'm seven, eight years old. And um, uh, uh, one of the dads, he was saying, do you want to play with us, with a real referee and real pitch and with a real jerseys and so on? And of course. And then he said, then we have to cheat a little bit. And I knew from my dad and mom, you shouldn't cheat, but just a little bit, he said. So uh, he called me Pelle, and that's a boy's name. So for two years, uh, they changed my name from Pia to Pelle in order for me to play a real game with referees and so on. And, uh, well, nobody said about that. You know, it, it is what it is. Uh, so find a way. And, and usually I tell that story because it has been for me as a coach as well. There is always a way. And I'm never alone. There's always somebody supporting me or somebody I can lean on because I can't take the same way or the same uh, journey as uh, a boy, a man, or, you know. So I have to uh, work it out in different ways. And those obstacles for me has been, uh, you know, I got friends. And I got uh, pretty good uh, self-esteem because otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here and, you know, say yes to, uh, uh, to be coached for the Brazilian national team. But that kind, it, it's always a way. There is a way. And you need grit. You need friends. Uh, and uh, a little bit of luck, of course. So that's how I started. Uh, a nice mother and dad allowed me to play football and good, good neighbors. Now I've got a couple of questions for Pia. First question, Pia. Obviously, you're the Brazilian manager now. Would you have been interested in the England job if you wouldn't have been the Brazilian manager? And are you still using your guitar and singing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I, uh, uh, after coaching Sweden, I was interested in, in, in coaching youth national teams, which I did. England is always interested, but I was just about to say, well, it's, uh, you know, I've been uh, coaching for so many years on the highest level. I couldn't turn down Brazil, uh, that's for sure. And uh, as in order to reach the group, I, I'm still singing. I tried to <laughs> surprise them <laughs> and they think I'm a little bit crazy. Well, she comes from Sweden and starts to sing in different ways. So. Uh, that's one way to tell everybody it's it's first of all it's okay to make a mistake you know i'm not a singer uh, and secondly you have to you have you need the courage you need the courage whatever if you want to be in the highest level and especially coaching uh be a coach and a female coach and just go for it uh and and the the uh, there have been a lot of pressure to winning the Olympic gold medal, whatever. But at the end of the day, it is all about the journey. And I want to have fun <laughs> during all the way to the gold medal. So, yes, I, I do play the guitar still. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Thanks, Jill. And I think we've got one final question from David um, just before we finish up. Um, David, if you want to switch your mic on. Yes. Hey. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yeah, can hear you, Dave. Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just, first of all, Pia, I'm such a, a big fan, uh, and it's really uh, quite remarkable to, to have the chance to, to listen to you here right now. Uh, just really quickly, curious if you were willing to uh, address the advantage that the women's program have here in the United States. Um, do you think that the rest of the world has caught up uh, yet or is catching up? And I'm curious how you would compare the footballing culture now in Brazil to what you had uh, to work with here in the United States. Well, uh, if everybody recalls uh, Anson Dorans in 91, uh, you know, put together Krishna Lilly, Mia Hamm, and uh, all those good team, good players, and um, a cohesive team. And that is one of the keys. And when I was coaching 2008 and go for the Olympic gold medal uh, and, and uh, work for five years, we had a lot of time together. 
and you can imagine uh, football is a teamwork. And um, I think still there is a little bit ahead when it comes to prepare. We talked about 84, for instance, um, where uh, the English team just uh, a couple of days before the team for Sweden. Uh, nowadays, you have uh, FIFA dates two weeks before. And I think in, in that aspect, uh, you as they, they have a big advantage uh, to prepare for, for uh, big tournaments. Uh, when it comes to Brazil, I, I just love the way uh, they try to solve the attack. Uh, they, come, they come up with different connections and uh, they are very technical. Uh, now, if um, I think the Brazilian team, if we can put together a little bit of an endurance and uh, a little bit of defending, uh, this could be a really good team. But it's a d totally different culture. Uh, I would say I've been in China as well. So those four countries, China, US, Sweden, and Brazil, they offer different things to, uh, to the table when it comes to improve the game. Uh, and I, I, when, I, when I see the World Cup uh, last year, uh, once again, uh, US, the best team, uh, you can tell the gap is getting uh, smaller and smaller. And it's... Uh, um, it's very, very interesting to be in the, the, the women's game today because it's so fast. The, the development is so fast. And um, I'm looking forward to see the Olympics and the World Cup 2023. Thank you. That was great insight, Pia. Um, thank you so much. Um, Jean, I'll hand it over to you to, to, to finish up, I think. Yeah, I mean... I uh, obviously, I'd like to thank our um, three guests today. And one of the things that I think is, is really significant is that each of you has had a huge legacy within the women's game. I know Ka Carol is still very active in, in, in her role in, in Hull. Um, Jill obviously went into coaching and um, has promoted the women's game ever since. And obviously, Pia... Uh, at, at an international level. So, um, you know, it's been an absolute honour today to um, talk to three pioneers of the, the women's game and um, thank so many people for joining us. Um, and I think if, if we were able to give you a round of applause, we'd, we'd give you a round of applause <laughs> if we're here in person. So. Just on my behalf, Jean, thank you very much for the invite to, to come on to this. And obviously, to I mean, I've seen Pierre a, a few times when um, I've been to the international games, but unfortunately not to get to talk. But it's nice to see her again, Pierre. And I hope that um, you do as much success with the Brazil team as what you have done with all your previous teams that you've managed. And great to see you, Carol. I mean, we haven't seen each other for a lot, a lot of years. And... You know, hopefully one day, maybe one day I might come through to Hull and see and have a little look when everything's um, back to normal after COVID-19 and come down to your club and just have a little chat. Yeah, Thank, thanks Jean for putting this on and uh, it's been an honour to uh, come on and tell everybody about our experiences. Um, thanks for putting our era up there in the uh, media. Um, lovely to see Pia and hear her talk. Lovely to see you, Jill, as always. We've got that te telepathy, haven't we, you know? We have. <laughs> <laughs> In the course of none, did say. <laughs> it's been lovely to see you all. Hope to see you soon. Stay safe. You too, Carol. And I would like to uh, thank you from deep of my heart. You're simply the best, better <laughs> than all the rest. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. brilliant thanks everyone and I think it's really important just while we've got Dan and Paul and a number of other people from um, Football Collective on that, that what this group is doing is kind of enabling this sort of activity so um, you know just the idea of a football collective is, is what we're trying to um, achieve with these sort of events and I know that Zoom can be challenging for um, people, but it is a way of getting together and marking the event. So uh, just really wanted to thank 
uh, Dan and Paul and Alex and a, a number of the others on the Football Collective because um, this is what you guys um, are able to achieve. And I know you've got loads of other events on today as well. So, um, yeah, just check out the, the kind of work that these guys are doing because it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Thanks, Jean. Cheers, Jean. Thanks, Dan, Paul. Keep in touch, Al. <laughs> and you, thank, see you soon, everyone. See Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.